Hi, uh, good evening. Hello, I'm Narelda Jacobs, uh, a Wajak woman, uh, Wajak Nyunga woman living and working on Gadigal country, which is where I'm joining you from tonight for the Oxfam virtual gathering on The Voice. How are we all? I would like to recognise that we are joining on the lands of the Gadigal people and these lands were never ceded and I pay respects to our elders past and present. And that respect is at the heart of today's discussion about the voice to parliament and one that I ask all of us to honour in your participation today. Uh, so please in the chat, let us know where you're joining from, what country you're joining from, we'd be keen to know. Uh, we have with us Thomas Mayo, proud Greg, Aboriginal and Cal um, Thomas, I'm going to get you to <laughs> say the, the Torres Strait Islands that you're from, if that's okay. You are an author and a signatory of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. What's your country, Thomas? Uh, yeah, I'm on Gadigal country. Um, so pay my respects to the Gadigal people and elders past and present. Yeah. And you are a uh, Cal, uh, Cal, Cal, uh, Urumbul, Torres Strait Islander man. Can you pronounce that for me? I've never actually, you know, all the <laughs> years that we've known each other, I've never actually had to introduce you. <laughs> yeah. So Kororig, Kororig uh, um, uh, identify as Aboriginal. They're the islands closest to the mainland in the Torres Strait. Kukugal, Central Islands in the Torres Strait. And Erebumle, which is up in the northeast of the Torres Strait. Oh, wonderful. All right. Great to have you uh, with us, Thomas. I know how busy you are. You're um, zipping across the country and uh, I don't I don't know where you're going to pop up next, but you popped up at my local train station, Central Train <laughs> Station the other day, which was just um, wonderful to see you. We also have Jade Ritchie, uh, proud Garing Garing woman and Yes 23 advocate. Jade, where are you tonight? I am joining you from Larrakia country. So I'm, I'm actually at home. So I'm a Garing Garing woman living on Larrakia country and I have done for about 10 years. So I pay my respects to the ancestors here that have kept me safe um, while I've worked and played here and uh, pay my respects to the Larrakia elders and um, and also my own elders who um, who taught me how to use my voice. So I'm actually back on Larrakia country this week because I'm uh, doing a play in the Darwin Festival and reading a script that Marcia Langton wrote. So a real honour to be doing that. Oh my goodness, it's all happening in the Territory at the moment. Gama last weekend, uh, the NEMAs, the National Indigenous Music Awards are on Friday and then your show kicks off on Saturday. Um, I hope the rehearsals are going well and good luck for the season. Thank you. Um, I would now like to introduce Andrew Buchanan, the Fundraising Director at Oxfam Australia, as our host this evening to give us a short introduction. G'day, Andrew. G'day, Neralda, and thank you. And a uh, really good evening, a very warm welcome to all of you. I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, uh, and I pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge the lands, clans and nations that you're all joining us from this evening too. These lands were stolen and sovereignty was never ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land, sea and sky country. And I also want to pay my respects to any First Nations people joining us this evening. Um, as many of the audience will know, Oxfam has a, a long history of allyship with First People, dating back 50 years where we worked alongside Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to help establish community controlled organisations. We helped establish the Closing Cap the Gap campaign, and we're really proud of the Straight Talk programme, which is supporting First Nations women to engage in political process. We're proud, very proud sponsors of the Uluru Statement from the Heart from 2017, uh, which, as you know, includes the call for a voice to Parliament. We're at a really critical moment in Australia's history where we can take an important step in the right direction towards addressing the conflict of our past, which continues to the present day. And we can move ahead by listening to the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as they say what will improve their lives. We're also at a critical point of, in the referendum campaign for a yes vote and it's vital that we become active citizen uh, participants to ensure the best outcome. By the end of this year, let's be on the right side of history. I want to thank Norelda, Jade and Thomas for joining us um, as our star panel um, this evening and I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much, Andrew, and really happy to be part of Oxfam's uh, town hall session tonight. Um, I mentioned Gama. I was at Gama and met some wonderful Oxfam people. Rod, if you're out there, hello. I know you're um, you're you're one of the the many people that we've got 
on on this uh, Zoom tonight. Um, it's going to be interactive, so we do want to hear from you. Uh, we're using a special feedback tool to help us get an understanding of your views and questions today. So for those using a laptop, then grab your mobile and use the QR code that you can see on your screen or click the link in the chat. Or if you, you can click on the link in the chat from your laptop. If you're joining the Zoom from a mobile, then you can click directly through to the website with the link in the chat as well. This will mean that you're still able to listen to the Zoom audio, but can use the interactive tool in your phone's browser. So there you go. You can keep interacting if you're on your mobile or your laptop. Uh, no problem at all. So jump on now. Let us know you are good by hitting the heart button and standing by for further questions. There you go. Look at all those beautiful hearts beating away, beating away. You're sending them flying into the um <laughs> into, the, into the web, into the web. <laughs> um, if you're coming in cold, give us uh, uh okay, let, let me just back up a bit. To start, let's do a little practice by showing how well informed you feel about the voice at the outset of the discussion. So if you're coming in cold, if you don't know too much about the voice, give us a one. If you reckon you should be up on the stage informing us what's going on, then give us a five. So do that now and let's just see um, what your level of understanding is. So at the moment we're in a 2.9, we're in a 2.9. Is that going to change from a three, a three out of five, three, 3.1, it's going up. That's pretty good. 3.1 is pretty good if that's where we're going to stay. Um, that means you know quite a bit. You could probably, um, it's probably a great opportunity to get uh, facts and the context of where the debate's at right now. Um, so that's that's a wonderful starting point. Um, let's get started, shall we? Most big ideas have a foundational story. And for The Voice, this is the Uluru Statement from the Heart. The statement was first delivered in May 2017 at a gathering of Indigenous leaders at Uluru. And Thomas, I'm going to get you to spend a couple of minutes talking about the origin of the heart and then read the statement for us. So Thomas, over to you. Yes, so the, um, the voice to Parliament comes from a long process of lessons learned throughout our history as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people seeking respect, seeking to be heard, uh, to be recognised um, and, uh, and to improve our lives. And uh, I think the best way to uh, show the lessons that go into the Uluru Statement, which makes the proposal for uh, a voice to Parliament enshrined in the Constitution is to look at just some of the statements and petitions that we have made before um, throughout our history. Now, this is just a snapshot. This isn't an extensive list of statements and petitions because often Indigenous people have come together uh, in aspirational moments, you know, um, after debate and discussion, put forward a set of modest proposals. Um, you know, we've done it many times. But here um, you can see on the left the 1930s there was the William Cooper petitions uh, to the King, um, 1963 the Yakala Bark petitions, uh, it was the Yolnu people, uh, that place that um, Narelda was talking about where Gama is held, uh, Yolnu people's land, uh, they were seeking to protect country. The Yolnu people, the federal parliament was moving to excise a massive portion of Yolnu land uh, for a mine, uh, and um, and one of the sets of words in the Yakala Bark petition uh, was that they feared that they would suffer the same fate as the Larrakia tribes, and so they saw the city built uh, across um, where Darwin is now on Larrakia people's lands, and they feared that they were wiped out, and uh, and they were fearful of that same fate. Of course, the Larrakia people continue; they thrive there. Um, they're rebuilding, um, and um, but the the only people took that case to the Supreme Court in the Northern Territory. They lost that case, but part of that uh, decision was a precursor to the Mabo decision um, in the 90s. Uh, the Larrakia petition to the Queen is the next one I'll talk about. 1972 um, to that place, Larrakia. Um, land. Uh, you can see uh, perhaps the, the thumbprints from some of the illiterate people of the time uh, putting this petition to the Queen. Uh, and the Barunga Statement in 1988. Um, Bob Hawke was a Prime Minister. You might see that small photo of Bob Hawke chasing, uh, shaking um, the late great Unipingu's hand, who 
uh, was very much celebrated his life uh, at Karma uh, just over the weekend. In common for all of these statements and petitions is that they all called for a voice. So this is an important pattern throughout the history of our struggle that we have always called for a voice or political representation. Um, and also in common for those statements and petitions with the exception of the Barunga statement um, is that they all were dismissed and ignored by the King or the Queen or the Parliament that they were written to. Now the Barunga statement I said was a little different. Bob Bork traveled to Barunga, a small Aboriginal community near Catherine in the Northern Territory, the Barunga Statement, like the others, called for political representation, a voice, um, and Hawke promised that. Um, and Hawke established the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. Uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission um, was doing some great work, and I'll just talk about another pattern throughout history now. Um, another pattern is that we didn't always wait for voices to be established. Hawke established ATSIC, but in the early half of the 20th century, after this nation was federated, um, we established representative organisations by our own means. Uh, the first one they say was in the 1920s, the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association. Another one is the Aboriginal Advancement League, um, FACATSI, and those voices were always silenced um, by the authorities using tactics of intimidation because they had complete control over our lives. They could steal our children, they could direct us to work without pay, exile us from country, decide who we could marry, all, all of those things they could control. And so they used those powers to silence those early voices. And then voices like ATSIC that were established by benevolent governments from uh, 1967, uh, so the first one was the national, um, was the NAC, uh, there was the NACC um, and ATSIC. But the same fate uh, was for those voices as the earlier ones. Um, they were all established um, by one government and then the next party, uh, the next government would come in and they would take that voice away. They would silence us. So when Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, when ATSIC was established, it was uh, against the opposition of uh, John Howard, who was the opposition leader. Uh, when Howard won power, he went about fulfilling that same pattern. Uh, he uh, amplified the problems that ATSIC had, though all organisations have problems from time to time, uh, but he didn't help or allow Indigenous people uh, to deal with those problems. Um, democracy didn't, um, wasn't allowed to run its course to deal with problematic leaders. Um, there were funds taken away from it. Uh, it was um, set up, uh, it was uh, purposely destroyed by John Howard um, and in the absence of a voice. Uh, after 2005, when ATSIC was uh, eventually destroyed, we saw the Northern Territory intervention and I'm sure a lot of people uh, in this audience know about the intervention, hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer money um, spent on intervening uh, in Indigenous communities built on largely a fabrication um, and, uh, and the Racial Discrimination Act was suspended to be able to do it. And we know for all of that money and all of the heartbreak, it made things worse. Uh, we saw hundreds of millions of dollars cut from community services under Abbott. Um, uh, we saw um, money meant for Indigenous benefit given to non-Indigenous organisations such as the Fish, a Fishermen's Association in the Northern Territory that use the money to fight against land rights. So with all of this, we came together and David's right, there was a review into ATSIC, I see in the chat there, um, and that re report was ignored. It recommended ATSIC should continue um, because it was important and it needed some reform, but it was completely ignored and ATSIC was destroyed. And so with all of those lessons, we came together in dialogues around the country, a unique opportunity to bring our minds together uh, and in, in an informed uh, series of dialogues, electing delegates to go to the heart of the nation at Uluru. And to summarize the lessons that we put into the Uluru statement is that we need a voice because we make progress when we have a voice, things get worse when we don't, we have little opportunity to defend uh, our gains or to make gains. Um, and that if every voice has been silenced before, then we need to enshrine it in the constitution 
so that it's the Australian people saying that Parliament should listen to the advice that Indigenous people have to improve their conditions and their lives, um, and that becomes a norm if we do that. The statement is also written to the Australian people because we know that those other statements and petitions were dismissed, for it, so it is for you to decide. Um, so now I'll recite the Uluru Statement. Sorry for the extra long preamble. It's important. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention, coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law and time immemorial, and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or mother nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished, and it coexists with the sovereignty of the crown. How could it be otherwise that a people's possessed the land for 60 millennia and this sacred link should disappear from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionately, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alien from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish, they will walk into worlds, and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of the First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted, in 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Thomas. Um, it's, and for those of you who've never heard Thomas recite uh, the Uluru Statement, he wasn't reading it. He's, he has been reciting it for years and years now. Uh, and every time, Thomas, it's uh, it's a really powerful thing. Um, we'd love you to use your civility tool to let us know um, how it made you feel listening to Thomas uh, reciting the the statement. So you can do that now, and we'll throw up some of those those questions on the page. Um, Thomas, what is it like for you reading the statement? I know you've done it hundreds of times now. Uh, Narelda, it still moves me even after reciting it. I don't know, maybe a thousand times. It's uh, it's such a powerful statement. But what really moves me the most is understanding um, that long history uh, and all of those lessons that have uh, been learned through sacrifice from our elders to try things, you know, to, uh, to put forward these proposals, uh, to learn from uh, the heartbreak and the broken promises and um, the things that they've built being taken down. Um, and also those names that are around the, the words that are popping up in the middle of the screen there. Um, around the statement, you know, the hard work that we did mm. to reach a consensus, that was no easy task for almost 300 Indigenous people to, to find a common set of words. 
Um, sure, not all of us agreed. There was about 20 of 270 that walked out on the second day. Um, but geez, that's a, a powerful consensus. And we cannot let all of that work go to waste. We must take the next step, but we've got to do it together. Thank you, Thomas. Um, Jade, how about for you? You, you know, we, we've we've heard the Uluru statement um, read out so many times and recited. What is it like for you hearing it? Yeah, yeah, you're right. I've I've heard it many times, and I've been lucky enough to be on the road with Thomas recently, so I've heard him recite it a lot. And what's interesting is wherever we go, when I watch people um, when they're when they're hearing it for the first time, you can see them go on this entire journey. You know, it, there's there's a lot in a statement that fits on an A4 page. You know, it talks of, of our struggles, it talks of our aspirations and it talks of hope. And um, I'll just share with you, you know, the first time I heard it, um, I had just come through another Royal Commission. Uh, I spent almost 20 years in the public service in Queensland and the Northern Territory, predominantly in youth justice and, and for a long while as Director of Aboriginal Affairs. And, um, I was feeling quite overwhelmed, pretty despondent by that point, because, you know, despite good intentions, uh, government kept getting it wrong. And it was a really hard thing, particularly my time spent working in Arnhem Land, to listen to community, but to try and get that message all the way down the track, as we'd say, and, and see um, policy be sh shaped in a way that communities could actually benefit from. You know, I've just felt very frustrated um, and we are, we're only just over 3% of the population. And, you know, for us to be faced with these massive structural problems that we were trying, we were constantly butting up against, you know, it just, it felt very lonely and like an insurmountable task to, to make proper change on the ground. So when I first heard the Uluru statement, what really struck me was the invitation to the Australian public. It, you know, the, the idea that everyone could get on board and actually want to see change and, and contribute and work towards better outcomes for Indigenous people. And I knew, having worked with a lot of uh, remote communities, but also my own community that I grew up in, that communities hold their own solutions. And I really mm -hmm. felt like what the Uluru Statement was saying to me is, one, giving us a say over our own lives that unlocks solutions but two let's all do this together so you know the statement really fills me with hope and that's why I've really jumped on this opportunity beautiful thank you well said Jade and the the, the context that um Thomas provided with the the history is so important because it just goes to show that this is a this really is a moment that we can't let slip which is what a lot of uh, the comments that are coming through now are, are saying um, and uh, we're going to now get some context around um, the hard bit, which is changing the the, the constitution. So um, the context we had that Thomas provided was why we need it to be enshrined in the constitution. And Jade, you are about to tell us, um, it was a bit of a civics uh, session now as to changing the constitution, um, what's involved with it. So over to you, Jade Ritchie. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, look, Thomas really gave us the heart piece there. That's why we, we need to do this. And this is how we know that this is the right step for us. Um, what we need to do is, is change the constitution though, to give us that stability and safety so that this body that we establish will, um, will, will be resilient to hostile governments. It will be resilient to, um, you know, changes over time. Um, the constitution is the document that defines the powers of government. So it was developed in 1901. And if we think about who was sitting around that table, in 1901 and, and who they were serving and, and what, what the priorities were then. It's very, very different to what we're facing now. And it's very, very different to who we are and more importantly, who we wanna be as a nation. So, you know, to change the constitution um, is, is the right way to go for us at the moment. Um, what we need to do to change it though, is to go to referendum. That is the only way we can, we can change it. And so what we need to see at the referendum is a, major, a double majority, which means that we need every voter to agree that, that, that they're voting yes. I mean, sorry, we need every voter to vote yes. And we need um, a majority of, um, sorry, let me start again. 
the way we need to, to win this at the referendum is a, we need a majority of voters and of states to vote yes. The territories don't count, unfortunately. So um, we're really looking for everyone to get out there and go and vote yes, but also go and have these conversations with people so that we know we're going to reach that majority. Referendums, uh, referenda are not easy to win. Um, we know that there's only been eight successful referenda in Australian history. So what we need to be doing and why we're having these conversations now is to go back to that heart piece, look at why we're doing this, look at what the question is, okay? And so we're gonna get into that now as well, what the actual change would be. And we need to be very clear in our conversations that that's what we're trying to do. It's extremely important that as we lead up to the referendum, everyone is informed on what this really is and why we want to see that change. All right, thanks, Jay. So a majority of voters in a majority of states must agree and the territories don't 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 feature um, in, in the count. Um, Thomas, so part, what yeah. are we going to be asked to vote on? Yes, yeah, so the question um, will be basically, uh, and it's not in these slides, but it's um, do you agree to an alteration to the constitution to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the first peoples with a voice? Um, the actual uh, provision, so 92 words, will be inserted into the constitution when we vote yes. Uh, and that is chapter nine, it's a new chapter nine, section 129. And basically it says this, in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, uh, there we go. In recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia, one, there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Two, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice may make representations to the parliament and the executive government of the Commonwealth on matters relating to, the Abri to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And three, the parliament shall, subject to the constitution, have power to make laws with respect to matters relating to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice including its composition, functions, powers and procedures. So just to summarise that um, to the simplicity that it really is, is that what we're saying yes or no to is this. Should we recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, if you could go back to the previous one, um, with uh, a voice that can uh, make representations on matters that relate to Indigenous people, the parliament decides the rest. So really we're saying yes or no to the principle of recognition and listening. It is that simple. Do we agree with that principle uh, to be in our constitution? The next slide is just uh, design principles um, that give uh, the Australian people a bit more of an understanding of how it'll work. Um, so for example, what the voice will do is it'll give independent advice to the parliament and government. It'll be accountable and transparent. It'll work alongside existing organisations and traditional structures. It'll be set up um, to uh, be chosen by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people based on the wishes of local communities. It'll be representative of Indigenous people, uh, gender balance, so male and female for each uh, of uh, um, the regions, including youth. The voice will be empowering, community-led, inclusive, respectful and culturally informed it won't have a program delivery function and it won't have a veto power uh, the reason why we don't say it'll be 24 representatives and they'll be elected from these regions and this is where the borders will be for the electorates um, is because that is not what we're voting on again we are voting on recognition and a say for indigenous people as a principle in our constitution an expectation that the Australian people are setting for all future parliaments. If that sort of information was there, 24 representatives, for example, we would be arguing over if it should be 25 or 26, you know, and not focusing on what the referendum is about, again, that principle. Um, the reason for point three, I saw someone ask, is because uh, I think I've just explained that. We're not voting on the model. So point three just says that the parliament should um, implement those things, and that will happen after the referendum in consultation with Indigenous communities. And uh, after the normal democratic process of debate uh, in the parliament. 
Yeah, a lot, a lot of people often say, but where's the detail? We don't know what we're voting on. Exactly like you said, is there going to be 24 people? Is there going to be 50 people? Where, where are they coming from? Are they going to be rep representative? But can you explain the size of the constitution versus the size of the legislation that comes after the referendum that then decides what the voice will look like? Yeah, so a good way to um, explain that to people, Narelda, is that... Um, the, if you thought if the constitution's this thick, you know, legislation for tax, for example, is this thick, you know, or native title, you know, our constitution is a, a quite a short document. It's it's not a um, it doesn't have all of the detail uh, for everything. So, for example, um, the constitution uh, gives the parliament the power to make uh, laws for the collection of tax. So it gives empowers the parliament to make laws about certain things. So for tax, it just says that they can do it, basically. Uh, it doesn't say how much tax or where the tax commission uh, should be or um, anything uh, of that nature. Uh, we elect parliamentarians. Um, so we elect a government uh, to decide those things. And we also elect, um, are able to hold that government to account for their decisions. And because of the flexibility that government has, so it's not rigid in the constitution that requires a referendum every time we want to make change, um, they can update the laws to, um, you know, to suit how our society and our nation is evolving. So to go to the voice again, it's simply saying there should be a voice as the form of recognition Indigenous people will have, um, and the parliament will decide the other things with Indigenous people. And the proposition being put to the public is really, really basic. It's in its most basic form and the rest of the detail comes afterwards. Exactly. Uh, now, I'm, interested, I'm interested if there are any questions on, on what we've spoken about so far. Remember, you can ask uh, questions using the interactive tool on your phone um, or on your laptop. Um, one question that comes up a lot is uh, about sovereignty and whether uh, the voice will impact sovereignty or somehow um, seed sovereignty or, or water it down. Jade, would you like to tackle that? Yeah, yeah, look, it's um it's an important question and it's 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 one that we've discussed heavily. So um I'll break it down into two parts. There is um expert advice. We've we've received a lot of expert advice that talks to the you know the legality of this. What I want to cover off though is is personally as an Aboriginal woman, I am not going to be any less garang garang the day after the referendum. This cannot Nothing can take away my spiritual connection with my country, with my culture. Um, that that's absolutely a personal thing. That no, this this cannot affect that. But for those who want to read the expert advice, um, Thomas, can you just remind me of where that can be found? Uh, the expert advice um, about sorry Sovereignty. the constitution not oh, yeah. so um yeah uh, professor megan davis has written about it so is tony mcavoy uh, the first indigenous silk um uh, the attorney general has also um and the solicitor general have responded to that uh fear um that we can't lose our sovereignty over this mm. and look, tony you McAvoy, McAvoy, you've got that yeah and, and tony mcavoy um yeah. who is you know a, a renowned legal mind um he talks about the fact also that our sovereignty currently isn't accepted or or um acknowledged officially um so you know government can't take or you know by by appearing in the constitution government can't actually take something that they don't actually acknowledge currently so you know the it across the board there is no way that our sovereignty can be taken from this because for one it's not not currently acknowledged by government um and it's something that we hold it, it can't be taken away from us because it's something that is personal to us it is and it, like the earlier statement says you know it is that spiritual connection that we have there and high court judges um robert french has said that nothing can impact no no court can impact sovereignty um and to me a constitutional expert says the same thing um so nothing impacts first nation sovereignty um and that's a really important point to make um a few people are asking why don't the territories count why doesn't nt and act count does anyone can anyone provide an explanation i, I know there's a there's a quirk in the history in in our history in the makeup of the constitution and that that's what's in the constitution 
If, if yeah. we want to change, we'll have to go to another referendum, I guess. But I don't know. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> quite simply, it's the states that um, uh, that measure, you know, a majority of states because they were the colonies. So from 1901 or pre-1901, when the, the nation federated, um, New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria, all the states, they were colonies. Um, and so the constitution was the sharing of power between those colonies. And so, yeah, it just hasn't been updated to include territories as part of the measure. It's just because the state. Part of referendum is now, oh, we don't want to go to a referendum to change how we do a referendum. Um, so I guess we just put up with with that with that quirk of, yeah. um, of our constitution. All right, so. The, the first part of the vote though. So, so voters in the Northern Territory mm -hmm. and the AP, they will count for the first part. They just won't count for the, the second bit. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right, so that's the mechanics. Um, there is a really vigorous public debate, don't we all know it, uh, underway as people consider whether this is the right path for Australia to be taken. Um, it's important that we listen to all of the concerns uh, and have the debate um, and reassure people who may not be sure how they're going to vote, that they can ask the questions and be a part of the conversation. Um, we're going to show you four frequently asked questions on the screen and ask you to rate them in order of importance um, to people you're talking with. So pull out your phone again and go to the interactive tool and let us know in order of the importance here, uh, what would you like to know? What's the most important question to you? Um, and what's what's the most what's the biggest thing that people around you are talking about, perhaps? So just rate them in order of importance and we'll tackle we'll tackle each one, uh, but in order of uh, of you rating them. And at the moment it's um the first by quite a while is, uh, will it make a practical difference? All right, Thomas, would you like to tackle this one first? Will it make a practical difference? Yes, absolutely it will. Um, because we know from, uh, there's plenty of evidence that shows that the best policies and programs are when, uh, um, and the best outcomes from policy and programs come from when Indigenous people are involved in designing them. Um, and so uh, the voice is about influencing the policies and programs uh, and laws uh, that are made about Indigenous people. Um, it guarantees that we um, will be able to make representations on um, those sorts of decisions. And so it's a very practical thing. Um, yeah, Jade, did you want to add to it? Yeah, look, I guess I just want to share, um, you know, my experience on the ground. Um, you know, again, I'll, I'll reflect on my time spent in Arnhem Land. Um, we, we've trialled this, we know that this works. So, you know, local decision making up in the Northern Territory, uh, particularly around justice, we um, we looked at, you know, if, if um, communities actually were able, so, so what happens a lot of the time is that um, policy and programs are designed in Canberra or in, in head offices. And then funding is put around that and, and sent out to community to be implemented quite often by NGOs. We flipped that model and when communities were able to say what the priorities were and what the solutions were and then we built programs around that we saw real change and we saw change from the beginning because people bought in people felt empowered and people had that lived experience and and you know i'll give you an experience on uh grid island peacekeepers so predominantly grandmothers went into the role of peacekeepers and when there was angst or unrest in community, grandmothers did what they know how to do best. And they mediated and they nurtured and they worked through to the solution. That Narelda, worked. Mm. Narelda, can I just answer one question that came up? If it, Someone asked if it worked in Arnhem Land. So if people are being listened to, if a voice is working in one place, why do we need this change? I think the question is, it's because the next government will come along and um, you know, scratch that program that was working out and restart another one. So you need a, um, you need a consistent voice. Um, and so what the Australian people are doing with this referendum is, is making it the standard, uh, the norm, you know, the expectation of the Australian people that, you know, that we should be listened to uh, for these programs and policies and that they should continue and the political games are stopped. So... Yeah. It's, it's a really important thing, the constitution and the Australian people, the will of the Australian people um, saying to all future parliaments, let's do things different, okay? 
Uh, and so if we don't do that, then you know, we know that what we're doing right now fails and that's chopping and changing programs, chopping and changing voices. And when um, earlier, Thomas, when you were uh, running us through all the organisations that have been in the past, ATSIC, NAC, NAWC, all of those organisations, um, I, I ask this question a lot of people, uh, both anecdotally and based on data. And while we had those organisations that existed, the gaps weren't as wide. And as yeah. soon as those organisations were abolished, now we have a situation where the gaps are wider. Um, yeah. Exactly. And one other thing is that, um, you know, what is working in Arnhem Land might work elsewhere. Um, there is a, a national representative body can take the best lessons um, from one place and promote those things, you know, programs that are working, policies that are working. They can also call out policies or programs that are wasteful, that aren't working, you know, and, and raise, raise those issues and, and see. And so ultimately, this is going to save Australian people, uh, you know, taxpayer dollars, not only save dollars, but save lives, most importantly. Mm. This um, is actually I'll going to save uh, a lot of money and people. And I know, like, I don't want to just concentrate on on uh, North East Arnhem Land and Yolngu country, but given that mm -hmm. Garma was just just on and the Prime Minister was just there, um, he he he's, he walked, walked out of a meeting with uh, or finished a meeting with the thirteen Yolngu clan leaders and addressed the media and said, like, we just we just met with these clan leaders, um, the Dalat Council, and they weren't talking about um, the deal to build nuclear submarines. They were talking about housing, uh, health, education, employment. They were talking about really serious things that impact First Nations people every day. You know, housing, you know, is a really important issue. So um, I think Thomas and Jade, it's the, the voice can give uh, advice about a lot of things, um, but it's the most important things that are going to be tackled first, right? And, and actually be listened to by governments, hopefully. Yeah, that's really important. And the representatives, and they will be democratically voted in to represent the regions, they will be held to account by the people that vote them in. And so if you're, you know, if you're living in a community, um, and we're talking, we're not just talking remote communities, there's some shared um, struggles here, you know, particularly around, you know, housing, employment, training, those sort of things, um, protection of culture, look, looking after our languages. Um, so if you're if you're uh, seeing your representatives go in and, and talk about parking fines, for instance, they're not going to stick around too long. So we're going to keep our, our representatives, you know, honest and, and focused on the priorities that, you know, those voices from the ground up will be advising on the things that are really important to us. Now, I think number two on the list was do all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people support the voice? I think that was, yes. Um, so, um, Thomas, would you like to have a go at this? Yeah, of course not, um, because we're not homogenous. Uh, we are like any other group of human beings with different experiences and perspectives that shape our opinions about things. Uh, and so um, uh, that if we were to wait um, for 100% of Indigenous people to agree on on anything, uh, like any group, you just wouldn't do anything. You'd never step, you'd never make a step forward. Um, but what we can rely on is that very extensive and uniquely uh, well-resourced and national process that led to the making of the Uluru Statement. Um, I believe that if that process was run again with 10 times as much resources and 10 times more people, uh, Indigenous people involved, you'd come with a, to the same outcome, which is why I took the time to go through that history um, that makes it just uh, such good sense that we would seek to do this um, now. And the other thing is that there's multiple polls. Uh, multiple polls indicate over 80% of Indigenous people will be voting yes uh, to this referendum. Uh, and that's not a small sample uh, for that most recent poll, uh, as some have said. Um, 800 of 800,000 is actually a greater proportion uh, than polling done uh, you know, for normal political polling. Um, and so, uh, and I believe that it's much higher than 80% now uh, because we didn't have many resources for five years without a commitment to this, um, to get out into communities and myself and others did everything that we could to take it to our mob um, and to educate them about what this is all about. Um, but we've had a lot more opportunity lately. Uh, I think it'll be well over 80%, probably in the 90% now of Indigenous people that'll vote yes. 
Well, Jane, is one of the main concerns that you hear is 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 that distrust in government that e even if the advice is offered, it's not going to be listened to and acted upon. Look, that that is one thing, but I think early in the piece. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were just cautious because we have been let down and we have been harmed. So people sat back and waited and watched. And then as we've been able to have these conversations, you know, quite <clears throat> often it's a case of just getting the truth out there and people go, oh, right, that, that's really reasonable. And what I can tell you is in all of my years of working across Aboriginal affairs and then more recently while we've been on the road with this message, there the commonality is wherever you go people want to be heard people want to have a voice on the the matters that affect them we all do agree on that um thomas the conservative first nations um people some uh, you know high profile names that we hear about a lot do they offer an alternative uh no um i think the no campaign hasn't offered any alternative or or any um, benefit by for Indigenous people uh, any improvement to our lives by voting no. Um, and so um, uh, there is certainly nothing progressive about voting no. Uh, and, uh, you know, from Conservatives, why would we want to conserve the status quo? You know, why would we want to conserve the status quo where Indigenous people are the most incarcerated people on the planet here in this country, you know, in our country? where people still live in third world conditions in our communities without clean water. Um, you know, all of these things, uh, you know, that there is, there has been no alternative put forward by anyone um, that uh, uh, is for the no. Uh, and even separating out, um, so some uh, Dutton's been saying now, if you separate constitutional recognition from a voice, you know, um, and it's okay to just legislate a voice, they support that. Well, you know, it debunks most of their myths if they're gonna have a voice in the first place, you know, you, you just can't separate out um, the form of recognition that Indigenous people ourselves have called for. Mm. There, there are two more things. Will it create special rights for one group of Australians and um, will it unite or divide us as a nation? Um, Jade, will it unite or divide us? Look, I'm already seeing on the ground the unity. There has been so much sharing in this process and I'm really lucky to be going around and, and talking to all sorts of people from all corners of, of different communities. It is unifying. You know, we had in the audience, uh, we went up from Brisbane to Mackay, stopping at each town along the way. We just had so many people come up and want to share. You know, there was there was Barry who'd spent time working in the Northern Territory, wanted to share with us stories of his working days with Yolngu people. We had other people coming up and just talking about beautiful relationships that they'd had throughout their lives and, and why they were just shocked that this hadn't been done before. You know, so I think we are all coming together and we're learning um, about, you know, what's going on for other people you know I think there's been a lot of um cognitive dissonance you know if it's not right in front of you it doesn't affect you then then you don't pay a lot of attention and what we're seeing this year is the conversations um have been amazing people really showing a lot of empathy there's a lot of goodwill in our country and this is the opportunity that we can come together and I'll, I'll go back to my first comments about the Uluru statement this is the opportunity to walk together. Um, you know, the, the news is filled with things about Indigenous youth being incarcerated. It's filled with, you know, terrible statistics. And I've got two teenage children that I'm bringing up in the Northern Territory. I don't want them to see themselves as statistics. I want them to feel part, a very important part of the fabric of this nation. And so it is, it's really beautiful to be having proper conversation about how we can make change on the ground. So no, I absolutely know that this is unifying. You often hear um, people uh, criticise the opposition for for being uh, divisive and and casting the doubt and um, and causing the fear and putting things in people's minds that simply aren't true. And then you also hear people saying um, that it's it's distracting the government from tackling things like the cost of living crisis. But when you watch Question Time, how many questions given? asked by the opposition to the government is about the voice, is about, um, you know, well, peddling mistruths and things that just aren't right. I mean, and th that division 
is taking the government's attention because they're having to answer things that aren't true. So who's actually causing the division here, Thomas? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's the politicians. It's the no campaign also purposely uh, doing that to make people feel like this is divisive. But this is unified. Jade's right. Mm. Um, and, you know, we're already divided because Indigenous people have never been recognised in our constitution. We're still on the margins, you know, statistically um, and, and, and in our constitution. So, um, you know, it'll be a unifying moment when Australia accepts over 60,000 continuous, uh, 60,000 years of continuous culture and heritage as something that we all share. What a wonderful thing that'll be. Something our children will definitely celebrate, um, you know, for the for generations to come. And just keep in mind, in 1967, there was no no campaign. There wasn't even, there wasn't a no campaign. There was no division. There was no opposition to it. So um, if we didn't have the opposition, the coalition of, you know, opposing it, there would be no, there would be no division here. It would be a completely unifying moment. Just the last point on that slide, will it create special uh, rights for one group of Australians, Jade? Well, look, I think, um, I think we need to acknowledge that, you know, like Thomas just said, we've got, 60,000 plus years of continuous culture that is special that does hold a special place in this nation and it's something that all Australians can be really proud about and really embrace um you know we talk about the closing the gap report and we know that there are big gaps that need special attention right now so what I think this does it, it highlights that we need a special solution here. We keep talking about this, but for decades, policy has gotten it wrong. So yes, we need a special solution in terms of special rights. So we just want the same rights as everybody else. And, and I, I, this really confuses me, the fact that we're absent from the constitution currently, we're asking to be in it. We're literally just asking for the same as what everyone else already has. In terms of the practical changes, we're asking that we have the same opportunities, the same life expectancy, the same educational outcomes. I feel like that's a very reasonable and moderate fair thing to be asking for. There's no special treatment here. There's not. There's no special treatment at all. It's just, uh, it, and it's not even. It, it's going to take a long time for the treatment to even be the same. That's how. That's how wide the gaps are. Um, Thomas, um, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. go, go for it. But even, even legally, it's not special treatment. Um, so, uh, you know, we still vote for parliamentarians like anyone else. All we're choosing is our own, is representation to give advice to the parliament. But any, any organisation, you know, lobby group uh, or individual can make representations to the parliament. It's just that we're genuinely voiceless um, as a people that are special to this country, um, our connection to this place and the injustices that we have suffered. Um, we're spread as, you know, less than 4% of the population across this great continent, you know, hundreds of electorates. Um, and so in this democracy, we are voiceless um, when decisions are made about us by the parliament, specifically about us. And so this um, was described um, by the Solicitor General. So, you know, second, uh, you know, legal um, uh, in, in hierarchy to the Attorney General. Um, that this enhances our democracy, you know, it strengthens our democracy. This is something that uh, that makes our um, our democracy stronger. And it's not going to eventually lead to a, a land grab or us paying higher taxes on on land ownership or anything like that. I mean, these are all parts of the scare campaign uh, that's Absolutely been. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's it's a complete scare campaign. I just ask people, especially those that have been around for a while, to reflect on, you know, um, in the 60s when Aboriginal people got equal wages, you know, when the Gurindji Wave Hill walk-off happened, for example, they said that if Indigenous people got equal wages, businesses would shut down, the cattle stations would go out of business. It didn't happen. You know, in uh, the 1990s with Native Title and Mabo winning, uh, you know, that High Court case, um, they said that people would lose their backyards mm. um, and their farms and that, you know, that didn't happen. When ATSIC was established, they said it would be a third government, uh, you know, and, and would be vetoing um, legislation and all the rest. It didn't happen. Um, yeah. So it's the same now. It's an advisory body. That's the simplest thing to remember, people, on here. Um, when you hear those uh, fear-mongering tactics, um, just let people know it's an advisory body. Wake up. It's not going to happen.
That's all it is. And I think that covers a question that's been asked, why should I vote yes? Uh, and, you know, we can't make it any more simple than that. It's it's an advisory group. It's not going to take away anyone's rights. Um, it's just going to improve the outcomes for First Nations people. That's the whole point of it. Um, thank you, Thomas and Jade, for explaining all of those points. Uh, we want to throw it over to the audience once again. Uh, remember, you started with a 3.1 understanding of the voice. I'd like you to go back to your interactive tool now and let us know uh, where that's at now, your understanding of the voice, where it is now. Um, we also want you to answer this. Uh, how do you intend, uh, do you intend to vote yes? And do you want to campaign for yes, just to get a, give us an idea of your enthusiasm for, for getting involved in the campaign? Um, well, understanding has gone up, which is which is great, 4.5%. So that's well done, Jade and Thomas. You help people have a greater understanding of the voice. Um, 4.7, intend to vote yes. And um, it's still kind of hovering around the four uh, out of five want to campaign for yes. So Jade, for people who do want to get involved, how what's the best way to go about it? Firstly, what I'll say, if, if you're still wanting more information um, and as you process all of everything we've said in this, we've crammed into an hour, go over to www w.yes23.com.au have a look at the resources there and look he won't tell you this but I will Thomas and Kerry O'Brien wrote a fantastic book recently and it is it's the handbook about the voice it's got all the answers in there and not only will it break it down um, so you understand it better but it's a great way of explaining it to your friends and family so you can either just hand it to them and they can do their own research, research or, or it's actually really great to, to go and find the answers and work them into your conversation. Um, and then for those who uh, want to get on board with us, and I do ask each of you to do that, we're up against the clock. This is the most important thing that we are going to vote on in our lifetimes, I'm sure of it. So um, we, we need more volunteers. We've got 22,000 active volunteers across Australia, but that is how we're going to win this re referendum. We need to make sure that everyone is fully informed like you are now. So go back to the website, sign up to become a volunteer, and that will keep you in the loop. Grab a T-shirt. Thomas, show us your jumper. We've got mm. some great merch. Um, the idea there is be visible, be really proud that you're part of this movement of the Australian people. Be really proud that you're doing the fair and right thing and show it. It's a really nice conversation starter, actually. <laughs> Yeah, wearing a jumper, even just wearing a pin. Um, start, heaps of people are wearing the pin. In fact, Rachel Perkins at the Logies was giving out really flash pins <laughs> to all the stars. It was it was great to see them all wearing it. Um, uh, we've covered a lot in the last hour. Andrew, I'm going to throw it over to you to uh, to to wrap us up. No, that was just fantastic. And um, very quickly, on behalf of Oxfam, I just want to thank everyone again for joining this evening. I know we've got many. Oxfam supporters and friends here. So thank you all for taking the time to learn from our fantastic panel and for sharing your questions and of course, comments of solidarity in the chat. Um, I also want to, of course, thank Norelda as our MC um, and Jade and Thomas for explaining the aspirations and importance of the voice so clearly, uh, but with such inspiration and humility. It's really been a privilege listening to you. I think as our panel has shared so powerfully, we really do have a once in a lifetime chance to walk on this journey together and change the country for the better. And I'm really sure we can take it. Thank you again, uh, everyone for being part of this event this evening. And Thomas, I'll just get you to say a few final words. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Oxfam, so much for um, putting this on essential. Um, and thank you everybody for coming and listening. Really, really appreciate it. Please volunteer. Please wear your shirts. Let's get out there and win. 60 days to go, only around that. So it's urgent. Let's get out there and win. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Buddha. Yeah, well.